things, some of these you will rapidly discover um, no logician, right? Um, and that's why I collaborate with Michiel, uh, who I can trust to tell me exactly uh, and be patient enough to, understand, uh, to wait until I understand. Um, so I'm going to interleave the very little bit of logic that I'm going to give uh, with the psychological cognitive uh, motivation for it. And I think the way for uh, you to look at this is as a way of trying to explain what a multiple logics program for cognitive science of reasoning looks like, at least according to us. I wish there were other people doing it so that we could compare, but uh, it's at the moment a pretty lonely activity. Um, so see how we get down, up, no, maybe it's switched off. Yes. Yeah. Forward, backward, and pointer. Oh, oh, right, okay, pointer, right, sorry. Okay, this is, a, nowadays one has to have an executive summary, right, so this is a one slide version of two hours of talk. And you can uh, get up and leave afterwards, after the slide, if you realize you're in the wrong room, huh? or whatever. Right. Um, so I stress very much the multiple. And I'm, I mean, I've, I've been here now for a day and a half listening. And I think that the stress on multiple is really very important. I keep hearing people, I don't hear people stand up and say, there is one logic. But I do hear people stand up and assume that there is one logic. Right? And this is very much an, uh, aimed at, you need lots, maybe not lots, but you need certainly more than one. Right? Well, why do you need any logics at all? Right? Because for a psychological theory of reasoning, contextualization is the hard part. Right? Uh, the psychologists, among, I mean, I, I have a sort of standard vaudeville psychologist in mind, and there are honorable, honorable exceptions, a lot of whom are here, but many psychologists' um, uh, view of logic is, uh, most of what they know about logic is false. <laughs> All right. uh, so you really have to uh, think, and one of, the, one of the things that they learn at their supervisors, me, is that logic is a uniform method of reasoning uh, part two, wherever. Right? Um, I think that logic is, 20th century logic became the most superb toolkit for explaining why logic is, why reasoning is always different in every context. Um, Okay, so if we need logics for that, we're going to need more than one, right? Um, because choice, one of the first issues in interpretation is what system are we going to choose to reason in, right? Logics define different kinds of discourse which have incompatible goals. You can't simultaneously indulge in telling a story and offering a proof. I mean, okay, you can get sophisticated and say, well, you can view a proof as a story. And this, that, and the other. I'm not talking about that crap. I'm talking about children's stories and, you know, mathematical proofs or whatever, whatever are the extreme examples. And I think the extreme examples are incredibly important for getting to grips with what's going on, right? So once you have multiple logics, and most of the time, I'm going to talk about classical logic as a model of proof and uh, logic programming as a non-monotonic logic uh, adapted to being a logic of stories. Or as uh, you might have remembered hearing yesterday, I think, I mean, I'm, I'm tempted to call it the story, the, the logic of gist. That's actually where, I mean, gist comes out of uh, discourse processing of a co cooperative kind. Uh, Bartlett was interested in 
understanding stories, right? And that's where gist comes from. This is a logic of gist, although it's not exactly what the, um, Valerie was talking about yesterday. Um, reasoning becomes the just, I don't know exactly whether I go as far as that, but it becomes another kind of action. So it's subject to instrumental issues, right? Why am I reasoning in classical logic? Well, I'm trying to do a proof. Why am I reasoning in LP? Well, I'm trying to tell you a story. Right? And it suddenly, there are all sorts of uh, instrumental reasons about uh, one has to unpack that, but it's, they're practical reasons. Uh, and pra the, the old distinction between um, practical and theoretical reasoning, I think, uh, at least takes on some interesting changes. Okay, Michel and I wrote a book which finally came out in 2008, and it has the background for all of this stuff. And I'm not going to do much of the formalism today, but the technical details and all the experimental details and everything are in there. It's okay, it's a fairly fat book, but it's got a very good index. Right? <laughs> and, and if there's no representative here from MIT Press, I'll tell you that you can get it for nothing on the web if you know where to go. And I can't tell you, but... Uh... Right, okay, so the plan, basics of logic programming contrasted with classical logic. Right. I'll, I'm going to operate on the minimalist principle. I'm going to try and tell you as little as I need to in order f to tie it up with the, with the cognition and the psychology. And you're, I hope, going to tell me when I haven't told you enough. Right. So student questions would be incredibly helpful as we go along. I have, as all lecturers, far too much material I don't have to get through it all. I'm, I would be much more interested to have a dialogue. Um, and, and most of all, I don't want you sitting there saying, well, I don't know what that means. Right? But you are going to have to take an awful lot on trust unless you're both a logician and a psychologist uh, and, and, and a neuroscientist. Um, OK, so the first little introductory thing is the first thing that Michiel and I did is waste and selection task. I slightly reinterpreted something we don't emphasize very much in the papers and the book. Um, and I'll, I'll um, do that, but I'll, I'll do some of the old stuff as well. Um, then looking at syllogisms, I want, to, I want to establish this idea of multiple logics. And most, the syllogism is, what is after Wayson's task, probably the most studied thing in deductive reasoning, most studied task. And it's since uh, the 1960s dominated by what I'll call the drawer conclusions task. You give a couple of premises and you say, what follows? Or if you say it very sternly, what logically follows? And this is to students who've not had it any logic class, so they don't know what logically means, but um, never mind that. So I'm going to compare that with the counter models task. Um, then I'm going to talk a little bit about the fact that LP is such a weak logic that you can actually give a neural implementation of at least the core fragment of it, the whole, it's the whole, it's, language, right? There's a distinction between LP, logic programming, and CLP, which is constraint logic programming. So it's a little bit like the analogy of propositional calculus to predicate calculus. Um, and we gave in the book a neural network implementation of LP, the propositional version, or the like propositional version. Um, and uh, the, there are guys out there, uh, there's a big community of um, neural implementation of logic now, and there are people working on CLP. Uh, so it's not a hopeless case, but it's a work in progress, I think. 
Cognitively, I think, I mean, the most important thing about that is that it tells you all sorts of things about tractability and scalability, which are important for cogn cognition. Um, and if I get time, which I think I probably won't, um, well, I will get time to talk about our autistic processing. So that's one of the examples of, of a prediction that we make on the basis of the adoption of this logic and the neural implementation of it. And then uh, some work that Michiel did uh, with collaborators in Amsterdam on ADHD, which is attention deficit hyperactivity. No, attention, what is, it? What is ADHD? Right. Disorder. Yes, that's the word. Indeed. Um, which basically sh is about uh, discourse processing. The frog story. Children's story. Right. Um, the next lecture, I'm going to talk about some work on LP and goals by Alexandra Varga, the PhD student in the University of the Central University of Europe in Budapest uh, on preverbal infants in the head touch task. I don't know who, whether you know about the, any developmental psychology, but the head touch task. And I picked that because it's, it exercises goal reasoning. Um, and then I'm, if, I, if, if I hope we get there, if, uh, the work that I've been doing recently with people in the Max Planck in Berlin, uh, Laura Martignon, and also with Alexandra, on non-monotonic reasoning in integrated with judgment and decision. So this is adding heuristics for decision into an LP framework. And the purpose is to produce a probability-free model of judgment, a very simple causal judgment task. And the purpose behind that is to try and get clearer about what the relationship is between that which is clearly not probability and uh, probabilistic treatments. I mean, decision, judgment and decision, JDM, is completely dominated by uh, probability models. And now uh, deductive reasoning is perhaps dominated by probability models. <laughs> I think it's urgent that we try to get a grip on uh, probability because there are not all probabilistic thinkers, but there are probabilists who think that it's everything. Right? And that's not a multiple logics program. So I think there. Uh, okay, so that's on the menu. Right, the basics. So the logic programming conditional is robust to exceptions. What does that mean? Right. Well, P and not AB uh, implies Q. Right? That AB is the abnormality proposition for that conditional. Every conditional has its own abnormality condition. And you think of it as a list of things that can go wrong. Right? It's a sort of disjoined list is the way that it, it works. So. Um, I'll give you an example in the, ne in the next slide, right? So the abnormality list proposition is AB. So if any abnormality is in evidence, then that will, AB will become f true, not AB will become false, and for example, modus ponens won't work anymore because uh, the conjunct in the antecedent is false. And it won't be true because you don't get the paradoxes of material implication in this lo logic. Very crucial logical property is that it doesn't explode. Right? You, can, you have databases which will contain inconsistent information. And a lot of different things can happen, but it doesn't explode. It runs into the sand of exceptions, I think is the analogy that I would use. Right, so all four conditional inference patterns, modus ponens, affirmation of the consequent, modus tollens, 
denial of the antecedent, are contextually valid. What does that mean? Well, sometimes they're valid and sometimes not. But it has to be well defined, of course. And it's uh, basically if there is no evidence of defeaters, where defeaters are a, a, a genus made up of abnormalities or alternative causes. So abnormalities defeat modus ponens inferences. I come to an example in a second. Uh, and alternative causes defeat um, AC and uh, DA inferences. All right, so this is not classical logic. Right. Um, okay, so we have a knowledge base, which think of as long-term memory. Uh, it's a very large base, think of it as long-term semantic memory. It's a very large database of generalizations. Uh, and again, you'll see the example in a second. And we also have a current model. Right? So we have a knowledge base, but there's some incoming information. That story, the children's story is coming in sentence by sentence. And we have to find stuff which is relevant in order to make the connections on the basis of which we can construct a model and we construct a unique preferred model of the situation. So, and we have a very particular semantics and talk to you about in a second. Right? So it, it's, it's a model of long-term semantic memory and its relations to working memory. You think of working memory as the model the current model of the situation that we're in, the story up till now, uh, and um, that's, it is the way it is because of the long-term knowledge that we have and the input that we got. Right. Um, as I said, because LP, net, LP is so, so weak, uh, it's possible to implement the propositional fragment of it, which is what I'm going to be talking about in this first lecture. Um, there are some very interesting correspondences to Bayesnets, right? The purpose of the last piece of the talk is, is this business of trying to get clearer about probability and what probability, how probability differs from LP. We think having a comparator is a very useful uh, way of thinking about what's special about it. Right, so LP is here an abstract mathematical computational model suitable for automatic system one reasoning, if you can still remember yesterday, right? System one and system two. I don't know whether I believe exactly in system one and system two, but this is an example. All its logical and computational properties are what we hear about system one. It can operate automatically, that is to say it doesn't continually need to keep, um, to have a central processor that is keeping track of the large, where it is in a, in a large uh, proof search tree. Uh, it can just, it's just spreading activation. It's a highly parallelizable algorithm which you can implement in the brain in, uh, in the kind of style that the implementation shows. So it's a good candidate for something which you're not aware of working, right? It, you can become aware of working, and when you're learning stuff to put into it, you're certainly aware of it. But with skilled practice with stuff, it actually becomes, you, become, you lose awareness of what it is. And it turns out that experts who don't teach really lose awareness of it. They don't know what they know. I mean, they look at the problem and they say, ah, that's one of those. And you ask them why, and they say, um, it is, it just is, right? So then, you know, it's chess. They didn't, they weren't born with chess, but, um, so there's a traffic between the automatic and the, and the aware. When things go wrong, you tend to become aware of what's going on. But it's a, good, um, it's a good candidate for system one type processes. But it has a, makes, gives you a very different view of what system one is than the standard uh, vanilla uh, psychological view, Evans's view, see. 
Um, and I, uh, it's partly tongue in cheek, but I'm inclined to call it the logic of gist because Valerie was so rude about logic in true psychological fashion um, that uh, the only mistake she made was putting logic on the superficial side, right? Because we're now talking about the semantics and the reasoning to an interpretation, and it's that that gives you the gist. So we have a rather precise notion of what, what gist would be, and I think it would be an example that would fit with a lot of what she has to say. Can I make a remark? I mean, though we had lunch together, we discussed it, but anyway, this is not logic. This is not logic. I mean, yes. No, this, even the, the first example, this is, is a programming rule. The semantics of that is the semantics of programming. The knot in there is not a logical knot. Uh, the semantics is dependent of the kind of the way you read it, you process yeah. it. Kowalski it's invented that as a logic of programming language, not yeah. logic, yeah, yeah. right? Right. Well, no, no. The, the last bit is not right. I mean, okay, we, we don't. I don't want to argue about the a semantic argument about the name, right? But it has all the properties of, of a logic. It's an intentional logic, definitely. Right, under the semantics that we apply to it anyway. Um, but that, that, yes, this is very nice. I mean, it's contentious what, is, what a logic is, right? But it's, it's complete and, and it, well, it's, it's um, highly decidable and so on and so forth. And you can prove the usual meta theorems about it. Another remark. I mean, in order to real programmer, proto programmer, so answer set programmer, have to know how these statements are processed. And he is using this knowledge. And this is in logic, not so usual. This is in writing the program, or? Yeah, if I write yeah, the program, right. okay, but, I have but to know what the machine will not, do with it. We're not, we're not, comes first and the long left to right. We're not here modeling the process that yeah, writes the database. Not even that, but also the, the sequence of uh, yeah, how you write it. Yeah, yeah. Huh? We're, not, we're not modeling the process by which the knowledge base is written, right? We're modeling, we're modeling the business of retrieving stuff during text processing. And learning is another whole uh, two or three talks, right? Uh, and we don't present to understand, I mean, our only strong claim would be that learning is very definitely not homogeneous uh, in the same way that logic's not homogeneous. Okay, so first example. This is the first thing we did. Everybody knows waste and selection task, right? Is there anybody who doesn't know? I mean, we heard about it several times. Yeah, right, okay. I just want to point, we didn't make a big thing out of this in the book, but um, I want to point out that there's another conditional which is often not noticed. That's the one in bold at the top. Right, I call that the context conditional. And that has to be understood in a cooperative logic as part of the story that sets the scene for the task. The rule at the bottom, the focal rule, the rule that Wason talks about as a rule, is, according to Wason, a classical material implication. He doesn't say that, it's not even clear whether he knew that, but if you add together all the things that he says to the subject about what's correct performance, then that's what it has to be, right? Despite the fact that he denied that logic had anything to do with human reasoning, he, he had this task, right? So, okay, so you can, everybody can do this and uh, I'm not gonna, go through exactly what the right answers are, but it's an example of the need for multiple logics, right? That's a conditional on each card. I mean, okay, it has a universal quantifier in it, but it's a conditional, um, logically a conditional. And you've got to understand it as a cooperative contribution to setting the context. I sometimes think of LP as the logic of the left-hand side of the turnstile. Right? You get a bunch of assumptions, and then you get a turnstile, semantic inter uh, whatever, um, uh, the Dutch deduction thing, and the, 
and then you get the theorem to be proved, right? So this is the, the log I mean, uh, traditionally logic never had anything to say about how you arrive at the, 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 the assumptions that you make, right? This is a story about a process, uh, except that the inferences here you're making are preferred model inferences. What is the intended model? What is it that the speaker is trying to tell me by this story in the simplest case? Right. Um, the mother of all reasoning tasks. Um, what examples as evidence do you need to decide if a regularity holds? Right. So which cards are you going to turn is what Wayson's asking you. If you interpret it as a material and classical material implication, then it's clear that you have to turn the vowel and the odd number and only between three and ten percent of people, well, there's a huge literature, so there's a lot of different results. But um, in the original tosses, some, somewhere around three or four percent of Wayson's very highly selected UCL undergraduates in London. These, are, these guys are not stupid, right? Uh, Three percent of them picked that thing. And however, if you have a, robu a conditional robust to exceptions, what's the correct response? What should the logically sophisticated, not logically sophisticated, I mean the naive person who knows that their conditional is robust to exceptions, what should they say? Well, well, Professor Wason, I'm terribly sorry, but your task is impossible would be a good start, right? Why is it impossible? Well, uh, if I turn over the A and I find a seven, it could be an exception, right? And indeed, when you start carefully talking to undergraduates, you find them coming up with exactly this problem. Once you've got that problem, you've got all sorts of, uh, all hell breaks loose. So you find them reason, desperately trying to find a consistent interpretation of what it is that the professor meant, right? That's what subjects do in psychology experiments. If you give them something which they don't understand, then they go off and do all sorts of weird things. And we document in the Socratic interviews uh, the huge variety of extremely creative questions that they ask themselves about what it is that's going on. Right? It's crucial that the exceptions do not make a con a database conditional, false. Right. I mean, this is not a conditional that you have in your database anyway, but the, so the, sub the subject is having to assimilate it to what they usually do with a rule, and a rule is something that applies in lots of circumstances. You don't typically have rules that only, are only ever issued once. Right. Um, and they're never false. KB rules under the semantics that we have is, are never false, right? Uh, they're merely ones that fail because of exceptions. You can think of them in philosophy of science terms as, as boundary conditions on a generality. It's quite a good, good way of thinking about them. Think. Right. But the focus rule, according to Wayson, must be treated as a classical material conditional, in which case, uh, if the uh, antecedent is true, then, sorry, if the antecedent is false, then the conditional is true. Okay, according to many of the subjects, it's another LP conditional. I mean, they don't come out and say it's a logic programming conditional, but they, if you look at the Socratic dialogues, you can see them struggling with the fact that they know that there are exceptions. Okay, so we, it's quite useful to contrast this with what a probabilistic modeler has to say. So um, Mike Oxford was a PhD student of mine. Um, uh, he and Nick Chater uh, came up uh, very early on with a thing called the probability heuristics model of Wayson's task, which views it as a optimal information foraging experiment, basically. So they set 
some reasonable assumptions about which cards are most informative and they show I mean you need uh, quite a lot more assumptions than that but they show that the probability of choosing different cards is uh, well predicted um, there's a lot of criticism of the number of free variables in that model I'm not so interested in in that but I would compare I think it's crucial to compare the psychology what they do is something very elegant you get lovely numbers you get statistical uh, significances um, they're essentially claiming that everybody's doing the same thing right? uh, and they're essentially claiming that I mean they have an extension of it which covers the deontic cases the the uh, if you are 18 you must not buy al alcohol in the pub cases right? um, so they have to introduce some uh, utilities into the thing they have this it's essentially the same model of the descriptive task and the, the descriptive task being the classical one and the and Cosmini's deontic task and that means that the two should be as easy as each other right? and I think that doesn't fit absolutely doesn't fit the psychology if you look at the Socratic dialogues which, which are published in the original papers right, you'll see the kind I mean you have to trust us right? they're the kind of issues that come up in talking to about 20 we conducted uh, Socratic dialogues with about 20 people and people say oh Socratic dialogue who knows what relationship that bears to reasoning in this task it bears a very direct relationship to reasoning what that subject is doing is justifying their turning of cards one after another okay they might well not have quite the same issues as they did when they did it silently when they do it with us it may change the data but it's very hard to discount the data about what their interpretation is if a subject says to you look I don't know what's going on because it, there could be exceptions uh, it's very difficult I think to discount that as something oh it's just an artifact of the fact that it's Socratic dialogue so what comes out of the LP approach is very rich descriptive uh, information about the range of interpretations that subject have you have to go and look at it but um, what comes out of prob the probability is a very sophisticated looking numerical model but it seems to me to make the wrong psychological predictions at the descriptive level uh, there's a footnote here and Ulrich did a wonderful thing and it, it wasn't a conspiracy between us because I hadn't had a chance to talk to him before the talk uh, but he talked about the, the deontic task and he said why don't we adopt deontic logic for doing the selection task well we did we we adopted for the reasoning about the drinkers in the bar and there were some very direct and very simple differences logical differences in the task so Cosmides became famous in a thesis of saying well look this is the same task but it just has different content content right so people know about especially undergraduates know about dr buying drinks in bars right and so that's why it's easy and she built a whole theory on on the fact that there's something very special so it's a social contract right but if you if you look at it in uh, in LP terms the descriptive task causes all sorts of interpretational problems because you're told that you're not to turn unnecessary cards isn't it? this is an example so you find subjects agonizing right they say well if I turn the the vowel and I find a seven I know it's false so I'm, so I'm done but do I then have to turn the seven that's unnecessary right so I won't turn the, I won't turn a seven what Wason intended was that for them to take a view from the end of the process and say which cards would you have to turn under the worst case sampling right so 
that's what we call contingency. Right? The responses about this card are contingent about the other card. To say nothing of the problem about saying when a conditional is true. There's hundreds of meters in the library of books about why it's difficult to say whether conditionals are true. And the, condi the LP conditional is true under very different circumstances than the classical conditional. Right? So Wason's task is uh, very difficult. Right? The, on the, the deontic task is very easy. You don't get any conditionality between what you decide about this drinker relative to what you decide about that drinker. Right? The police don't go into the bar and say, you're 17, you're drinking gin and tonic. Um, it depends on what this guy's drinking, whether or not you've committed an infraction. Right? It's a case-by-case -case issue. And it's a very simple result of the deontic logic. Now, deontic logic may be complicated, but in this case, that's a very simple result. And sure, you can, enough, you can do the, you know, we, after the dialogues, we did uh, a bunch of experiments showing that these things are factors. Right? And I think we were only scratching the surface. There's a lot more interpretational problems than we actually uncovered. Um, Okay, LP validity, truth of conclusion in a unique minimum preferred model. I said that, I think, a cooperative logic. The semantics that we use is tailored to the understanding of cooperative discourse. So this is what I mean by saying it's the logic of gist. And so what we're modeling is the task by which you hear a story and you construct a preferred model for it has nothing to do with the truth in, general, in absolute terms of any of the propositions. All you know at the end of the story is that what the speaker has said. Right? What the speaker has said is this model, results in this model. Right? So it's um, very definitely, I mean, I would say, in general, again, listening to psychologists talk about uh, this reasoning, they talk about, so for, um, for instance, talking about system one as, you know, belief intruding. Well, the first thing about lo all logics is that they're hypothetical. Particularly classical logic is hypothetical. You very often reasoning about things that you know are in fact false, right? or you don't know, right? But you assume hypothetically the premises and then you reason whether they are true in all the models. It's the same with LP. I mean, who knows if I start telling you a story about once upon a time there was a cat, you don't know whether it's a real story about something that happened to me, something I read in a newspaper, which may or may not be uh, a fiction, or whether I'm telling you a fiction. And it doesn't matter very much. The system one knowledge base operates in very similar ways. Right. At least at the first pass. Yes, there are special things about fiction, but not, not at the level uh, which we're talking about. Um, okay. Uh, in 97, before uh, I discovered Michiel or the, the logic, Peter Yule and I showed that you can actually do syllogisms if you're very clever you can do them in a non-monotonic interpretation of the task. Right? So, in other words, you can make it so that the preferred model that you always get is always the one that's prescribed by classical logic. So it's a bit of an empirical nightmare, the syllogism. Right? I mean, it's absolutely... I don't think it's historical accident that this is the fragment that Aristotle discovered. Right? Um, so there's all sorts of interesting uh, interludes. But if you really want to find out whether people understand, in some context, understand classical logic, then the thing to do is to pick the context which is tailored to the concept of validity. Right? And it, it is what's usually called the counter models task. So I'm going to give you some results that we got it's, we were not the first people to run the task. People had run the task, but they make very peculiar conclusions from the task. So we'll just quickly have a look at that. 
right? So the concept of validity in classical logic is failure to refute, right? Is there a counter model to these premises, a counter example, and counter model is the technical logical term, right? So it's doubly negative, right? You're you can't conclude the simplest model theoretic level you can't conclude until you've ruled out there being any counterexamples. It's a very peculiar, doubly negative occupation. All right, so we decided, right, we'll do counter models. And we decided to beef it up by introducing a character called Harry the Snake. All right, Harry the Snake came from Chicago. He carried a violin case. He had a fedora hat. And... Uh, we didn't actually act, act this out, but English uh, subjects at least know that Harry the, State, Harry the Snake is an adversarial partner. He's at the fairground offering bets on syllogisms. Uh, we did them actually contentfully, but uh, I do it in A's and B's here. All right, so Harry says some A are B, some C are not B. I bet you that uh, it follows that uh, some, what is it, some C are not A. And your task is to decide, first of all, okay, am I going to bet against Harry? So you're free to agree with him that it does follow, but if you don't, uh, agree, then you'll bet you bet against him. You're told that you have good life insurance, so uh, he won't actually be able to get at you. Right. But the crucial thing is that it's a dispute. Right? You disagree with Harry about, uh, the, about the fact of the matter. Right? Now, if you look at the counter models that subjects produce, there's a very substantial number that produce counter models to this syllogism, such as a single element model with an A that is not B, but is C. All right. All right. Now, what's special about that counter model? Well, what does it have to be to be a counter model? It has to have true premises and a false conclusion. All right. It's got to be an exception. All right. So this is what you're looking for in classical validity. You're trying to show that there are no exceptions. So if you can produce a counter model to Harry's exceptions, it doesn't matter whether he's carrying a violin case, you know logically that it's false, right? It's not, it's invalid, right? Now, so the, the, um, the conclusion is false, right? Are the premises true? Well, some C's not B, that's for sure. So that's true. What about all B or A? Right. Well, true or false? You're not going to bet against uh, Harry, I can see. Right. Uh, well, there are no B's. Right. If it's classical material implication, that means it's true in this model which is what you're being asked about, right? So, they're offering a valid counter model which depends on an empty antecedent conditional, which is the paradoxes of material implication. These are people who've never had a logic course, right? In a dispute situation, they understand perfectly well that this would be a valid counter, uh, Counter model. Okay, if, if it was just two or three, uh, they might have done it by mistake. But there's enough that uh, one can, I think, dismiss that. I'm lost, sorry. Uh, I cannot see why this is a counter model. I mean, this is a perfect model, isn't it? It's an A, all B are A, and some C are not B, right? I mean, all B are A, so there are A's which are not B. Yeah, I haven't got, sorry, I, 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 I missed the conclusion off, right? 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 So some, I'm, I'm sorry. I think it's a Assume there is a counter model. There is a counter model. 
Right. Uh, right. Okay. Okay, so this is what I think establishes the, I mean, it's a much longer story demonstrating that, that the standard task without the Harry the Snake, without the counter modeling, induces um, non monotonic reasoning. That's a much longer argument, but that's in the Yule paper and it's old, old, old stuff. Um, so that's two logics, right? I mean, okay, not all the subjects produce these things, but quite a lot of them do. And the argument is that if you put the logic in a context, in a paradigmatic context, which makes it as clear as possible what it is that you want the subject to do, they do indeed recognize the principles of classical logic. Right? I think it's a very surprising result. We've got 50 years of people churning out this stuff about people are useless. You know, all naive subjects are useless at syllogisms. They're very good at some syllogisms, but they're not syllogisms that you need to uh, uh, worry about. You can do them non-monotonically. Um, how am I doing for time? Right, okay, I'm, I'm going much too slowly. Right, this is what I thought. Um, okay, nets are possible because of constraints on the logic, unique preferred models. Feedforward networks allow extremely efficient, scalable parallel computation, basically spreading activation. Okay. Um, so there's forward reasoning in these nets, they're, they're feedforward networks. You can reason forward or you can reason backwards. MP, DA are forward, uh, AC and MT are backward, right? Your categorical proposition is either the antecedent or the, or the consequent, right? It's a very simple form of backpropagation, not what you get in distributed networks. It's, a very, very, it's more difficult than forward reasoning, but it's computationally only a little bit more difficult than forward reasoning, just backward reasoning. Um, you need a double sheet architecture to accommodate the three valued cleaning semantics, true, false, and indeterminate, right? I've skated over, that's what makes it cooperative. It's modeling this business of the only task is for the speaker to say things which the hero will construct the right preferred model from. Right? Um, so the negation of the abnormality proposition AB, right, not AB, remember in the, in the logical form, the antecedent neurally mean, sorry, the negation means that it's normally inhibited, right? So this conjunct, this, this funny business clause, right, the AB clause is normally negative. So in it's, it's, in the jargon of the field, latched, right? A neuroscientist's gross model of the mammalian brain, and this has been going since I was an undergraduate, right? So it's got legs, is that the midbrain and the hindbrain produce the impulses to act, and the cortex sits on top saying, no, 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 right? It's a sort of Freudian model of the, of the, of the brain. Um, and it's that inhibition of the, those abnormalities are normally held in, actively held in, in, out of harm's way so that the conditionals fire. Right? It's well established that the autistic brain has trouble with inhibition as do the other major psychiatric syndromes like uh, ADHD, uh, schizophrenia, for example, OC, uh, obsessive compulsive disorder. All of these things have different problems with inhibition. Um, but the autistic brain seems to have particular trouble with this latching of the abnormalities, right? Um, so, it's not any, any negation, it's that particular negation that seems to cause trouble, right? If the problem is 
abnormalities, units, and their control and release from inhibition, which patterns should be affected? Well, they involve exception handling, and basically MP and MT should be affected, AC and DA should not. And that's what you see. Right? So in the suppression task, uh, the paper by Pinacker uses Burns task, and that's the materials for it, and that's the thing. But the, the summary is that the autistics have problems with the abnormality handling. They treat the other conditional patterns just fine. So they're fine with, with AC and DA. They do very much what the normal controls do. So if you think back to Valerie Rayner's talk, she was talking about autists sometimes looking as if they're reasoning classically. Right? And it's very easy uh, to see why that pattern is going to pop out sometimes. But uh, in fact, uh, it's not as simple as that. It has to do with this business of exception handling. Okay, I'm going to skip the ADHD, I'm afraid. I'm sorry, I hope there are no linguists here because that is basically applying um, constraint LP to the processing of tense. Okay, why tense? Well, settling the time relations in the model is absolutely crucial to understanding narrative and every tensed, every finite clause in the natural language has if you have tense at all in the language, it has a tensed verb. And if you don't have tense, then it has some other markers uh, which, are, which are doing the same work. So it's a very widespread problem, which you're not going to hear about anything from me, I'm sorry. Okay, summing up, cooperative discourse processing is a different kind of action than classical logical countermodel reasoning, and they're incompatible. Right? You can't do both at the same time. The design of the logics is instrumental in achieving the contrasting goals. LP's weakness, its uh, syntactic form makes search easy and exhaustive so that you can conclude from the fact that you don't find any evidence of an abnormality, you know, search of a potentially large database. Uh, absence of evidence means that truth of the negation, called negation as failure. Right. I think experimentalists should see here a very different relationship between formal systems and data. So if I listen to the system one, system two discussions in dual processing model, whatever version of them, I hear two systems which are supposed to be trying to do the same thing. One of them is a poor man's version of the other one. I don't think that's the relationship at all. I think that you've got uh, a background LP system which tries to interpret any new information and you can't turn off, it operates all the time, and you've then got some more specialized things like classical logic and probability also, a system too, which do need management, which do have to be cogitative, and which are what people tend to think of as reasoning. But ruling this other stuff out as reasoning is a very bad idea. Right. The, seal, the field's sole attention, and I, when I say the field, reasoning and decision and judgment, right, their sole attention has been on extensional adversarial reasoning. Right, so Wason just assumed that it was adversarial, even if he didn't know about classical logic. Um, we've done the same argument for the Linda task in judgment and decision. Right, they assumed that it was probability that the subjects were using to interpret the task, not narrative processing. So blind, there was a blindness on the experimenters' parts to intentional reasoning, cooperative intentional reasoning. And you can't understand the extensional reasoning unless you understand the intentional uh, framing of it. And probability is a rather strange fish, right, um, which we'll come to next. But. Now we're going to 
Thank you for your attention to the first half and ask for questions.